You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it's the Locked On Nets podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. I'm Adam Marmbrecht. He's Doug Norrie. And oh, no, the Brooklyn Nets lose in what was supposed to be a nice little bounce back game for them against the Sacramento Kings. 112-101, they fall. We're going to get into some uh, personnel issues along the way here. Going to talk about maybe the coaching staff and their role in this whole debacle. But ultimately, Doug, let's start with who they played against. The effing Kings, who are supposed to be kind of a layup win. How are we on a Thursday, whatever it is? We're bad. Like, I don't know what else to say. This is so terrible. We, when we went into this part of the road trip, we were making predictions around where they would stand over this uh, four-game stretch where we knew it was going to be tough, right? Warrior Suns, um, uh, Warrior Suns, this game, and then ah, whoever they play next. I'm all out of it now. But like we knew, and our guesses were something like, you know, ah, okay, two and four, or excuse me, two and three, you know, kind of hedging it a little bit. But among all those things was that the Kings game was a layup win because they stink. <laughs> they yeah, stink. Jazz next, like, by the way, just in case you're Oh, wondering. Jazz, right. Sorry. Yeah. So that'll be the, fun. Like, <laughs> well, they got a little banged up too, so thankfully. Yeah, yeah. But like, um, and so all, but, but all this was predicated on, okay, we'll start with a win against the Kings. And then we'll build out our we'll, <laughs> and then we'll build we'll go out from there <laughs> our projections from there, and it's for a part of the game looking like this is going to be pretty easy, and then it just totally gets. I mean, this is a disaster. I I don't really know the way another way to put it. I'm really actually not a skies falling kind of guy. Um, I think if you've listened to this podcast for a long time, Adam and I both aren't like this. Like we're just pretty even handed. Someone even comment, commented this, like uh, the other day about us being too rational, too even-handed. Which, <laughs> but which by the way, you can't be too rational. So that's right. uh, <laughs> like, totally impossible. But um, man, is this, this is the worst loss of the season. We called the Rockets game that they lost uh, in December, the worst loss of the season at the time. That was correct. The Rockets are also completely terrible. Beat the Cavs. Consider- Woo! Yeah, but considering <laughs> yeah, <laughs> considering the context, it, it, they didn't have Darius Garland. They were playing uh, random dudes. Like considering the context around this one, and sort of like kind of at this point, how badly the Nets need to win, which they yeah. actually didn't have in their back pocket before. You mm-hmm. know, when they were sort of floating near the top of the Eastern Conference. Considering the part was like, hey, now we actually kind of have to start winning these games. We cannot continue to sleepwalk through some of this stuff. And to lose this one is is easily the worst loss of the season. Like, I don't really know another way to put it. Kudos to the Kings, I guess, for playing hard. I, like, this was more about, and we'll get into all the things that happened here. This, I would call this you scored game 62 fail- points in the first half against them. Like, I, I don't even know. Like, uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. This is a failing across all the entire organization. That's how I, that's how I actually look at it. Actually, this there is like go. a three level failing. Like, <laughs> and I'm being serious. Like, it's no, I know. It's just, yeah, we're going to point to Harden. We're going to talk about Nash. We're going to talk about all this stuff. Like, everyone's to blame here. As far as I'm concerned, this is a very, very bad loss. I'm not this kind of guy that, like, is like, we're not hot take kind of folks, but. Like, how can you walk away from this? There's nothing, there's no positive to take from this game. No, and I really don't know how, again, coming off of two games against Golden State and against Phoenix, where 110 106, we know how close that was against Golden State, even the 121 111, it was closer than a 10 point loss there against Phoenix as well. Like, I don't know, I don't know how you, you put out performances like that where you you essentially reaffirm this idea of oh it's just about the health it's just about getting everybody you know back on the court together it's only cuz Kevin Durant's not there and and Joe John Joe Harris and every, Joe and Joe Johnson's going to come out and he's going to play for you too but it's like it's all of these little pieces that you kind of check and say here's all the reasons why even through and I said it even through these couple of difficult losses against top talent in the west you can still feel good about where this team is at and then you come out and you lay a total goose egg, and it's not even it's not even that, too. It's not that you laid a total goose egg. It's that you started the process of getting the easy win and then somewhere in the middle yeah. of it decided, you know what? I don't right. know if we really need to be focused on getting this win. And when you look forward to the schedule, we keep talking about this. When you keep looking at the games that come up, whether Utah's beat up a little bit and then followed up by Denver as well, like it's just they start to compound. And now it doesn't matter. Now the, now the Phoenix game, now the Golden State Warriors game, they do mean nothing. Now, anything that I said around taking away positives from them, 
they don't matter anymore because you didn't apply them to this game and get an easy, what should have been a very easy win. Yeah, that's a great point because we talked about, like we sort of discussed in those previous ones, we didn't, I mean, I guess we kind of said it, like the moral victory part, which everyone hates yeah, yeah. to say. And, um, you know, it kind of hurts coming off the mouth. So I, I totally get it. Bad mouthfeel. Yeah. Well, you're right. But that, but that's just what you're totally right. That washes all this away. Like this game washes all that crap away because it, it, it doesn't. Well, now that other stuff looks even worse, frankly, by comparison. And this yeah. game, like you said, where they're winning double digits by a team that, hey, hate to break it to you, stinks. Like the the Kings stink. There's no no way around it. They're one of the you know, near the bottom of the league in the la in, in the West right now. The p point differential is terrible. They've been getting crushed by teams in the short term. Like they're terrible. You're getting beat and by guys be that they're trying to trade away. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and <laughs> right, and you're beating them by <laughs> double digits. And for something happens going into the second half where they never came out of the locker room, the Nets never came out of the locker room and slept walk completely through it and end up losing like a such, I mean, by 11 points, such an embarrassing loss. Like I, I, I it's so bad. I, I don't, 64 I don't really points know. in the first half, like I said, and then you follow it up with 39 points over the final two quarters, scoring 39 points against what is in terms of defensive efficiency, the second worst team in the league to yeah. only the Rockets like yeah. is so embarrassing that I just don't even, when you have Kyrie Irving and James Harden on the court and, and frankly, anybody else, um, yep. just name any other three random guys in the NBA that that's who you get to throw out there. Putting up 39 points against that group based a lot kind of like on effort too, where it seems very clear an effort thing, to, especially, especially late is just embarrassing. I, I don't really know. Okay. I'm going to hope that once we hit May and June and we're in the playoffs that again, we never think about this again. And that is often the case with sports is the thing you think is really important in the moment ends up not being that big of a deal later. We see it. it uh, there's legit infinity examples of this. So I totally get it. Right. And in the moment right now, this one feels so bad because of what it sort of cements around the fears that Nets folks have around this team right now. Right. Like, yeah. uh, like there's legit concerns around the makeup of the team, the leadership of the team, the leadership among the superstars of the team, and the and the ability for the role players to capitalize on what's happening, like every step here, your what happened in this game, if you were worried, only reaffirms those worries. Like it doesn't, it makes it, it actually it magnifies them. Like you are really beyond the pale in how you feel about this team after watching this loss. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and you mirror a couple of good things that I think we'll flesh out a little bit more over the course of it. Obviously, specifically around J James Harden's performance, there's the <laughs> there was a time over the course of this game where I was like, can't wait to be singing a couple of these guys' praises in the post game podcast after a nice oh, yeah. W and and everything that they accomplished. That all goes by the wayside, but the leadership piece I think is something that. I, you know, it's interesting. Everyone's talked about what is Kevin Durant's leadership style. Obviously, when he's on the court, he just makes the team better and you win more games. But there, maybe there is this. It does. It's an interesting thing to keep in our back of our minds here too, around Kevin Durant not being there and seemingly that there is not someone at the helm of this team, specifically when out there on the floor. Yeah. And you still have two superstars. Obviously, Kyrie Kyrie hasn't been around. Next step up is uh, getting into some of these players here. But first, uh, what bet online, my friends? Oh, Bet Online has you covered this season more props, odds, lines than ever before. We're in the heat of it in terms of basketball. As you know, football headed toward the big game. Mar they've already marched through the playoffs, headed toward the big one. Uh, it's just a couple, uh, less than a, it's about a week and a half away, but betonline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. Not just football, not just basketball. Bet Online has up to the minute info, pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, all along with live. Uh, real-time updates of current games it's your one-stop shop for all of your betting needs don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available for the 2022 season and beyond bet online where the game starts and of course you made us your first listen of the day and we appreciate that why don't you make your second listen of the day the trade deadline episode that's gonna be coming up on the locked on podcast network thursday February 10th, 3 p.m. That is the deadline. You're going to have Locked On NBA podcast hosting coverage from 2 to 4 with your host, Kim Becker, John Carlos from the Locked On Celtics podcast, Locked On Fantasy Basketball host, Josh Lloyd, getting all that analysis from all the local experts, maybe even us. If the Nets make a move, be sure to subscribe today over on YouTube so you're up to date when the deadline hits. Here's the good stuff. 
what the save the tag <laughs> explicit tag stop myself just shy what what the heck is going on with James Harden in this game man because I listen a little bit of, I gotta eat a little bit of crow on this I just came off last episode saying hey Harden clearly just needs to be able to be well rested and then he's, he's going to be in good form everything's good. cool the science is solved I, there's a world where I don't it, James Harden didn't want to play he did he, he clearly did not want to be playing in this game because you cannot be James Harden with your level of talent and score, did he end up with two points? Did he finish with two, or did he drop in a lazy bucket at the back end of it? It doesn't nice matter. Four, anything, four points. Yeah, four great. Points. Excuse me. And by the way, also had the technical foul that seemed a little bit of a cheap shot. So positive three on a on a point differential. It, it, it's inex. It is inexcusable for James Harden to put out that kind of performance in a game like this. This is the layup game to to carry your team to a victory. Be Houston Rockets style, dropping 40 on the Kings, James Harden. And instead, it was, again, he was completely disinterested in being a part of the process of playing the Kings tonight. Yeah, dude, the numbers are pretty damning here. I, like, this is one of those ones where the numbers back up the eye test. The la There was no aggression. There was just nothing to be done here. He... Because at one point, like we've talked about this before, I tend to not watch the box score too much. And I was thinking to myself at one point, I was like, has he driven to the basket one time this whole game? And yeah. I was like, because I, I don't know, it was like sometime in the second quarter. I was thinking, it's like, yeah, this looks like a little weird. Yeah, they're trapping him. They're playing tons of short roll off of him. Like, just if you go back and watch the game, like, think to yourself, how many times Claxton and then later Blake caught the ball really yeah. high, right? And then made decisions. That's usually a sign that Harden got trapped like really high and then passed out of it really quick. Okay, fine. Like, that's just what you need to do. Except that there was no counterbalance in that compared to like counteracting whatever was happening here, right? It's like, okay, they're going to do that. Like, how are we going to not have this happen? Like, he was sort of happy to have it happen. It was like, hey, I just get rid of the ball super early in the possession, and that's kind of the end of what I have to do here. And, that's why like, he and that 12 was, assists and 12 meaningless assists effectively. He had more turnovers than yeah. he had more turnovers than points. He had six turnovers and four yeah. points. Like, this was easily his worst game as a net. I'd argue that this is probably his worst game Without looking back in the game log, my guess is this is like something like the worst game of at least the last half decade for him or something yeah. like that. I feel comfortable saying that. I'll throw it in the show notes because I'll look it up right when we're done. Like, my guess is this is something like the worst game of his career, maybe since like he joined the. It's got to be close. Like, this is how bad this game was four points, six turnovers, 12 assists, eight rebounds, completely disengaged, zero free throws, which yeah. is usually a very good proxy to like how aggressive you're being because we know that his free throws have actually spiked back up to previous numbers in the past which means he's continuing to get that aggressive nature of getting to the rim which goes back to what i was saying it was like hey it, has he driven to the rim at all well it turns out he hadn't like he yeah. just never tried a, a little bit late in the fourth quarter he tried to do it but it was way too little too late this game was it's his worst game as a net like i I don't know. Like, I guess you're allowed one. <laughs> like, oh, no. Know. Yeah, listen, I, I, I'm going to tap into it, too, because you brought it up in the last segment around leadership, because then it's it's not nearly as egregious. It didn't look the same, didn't look lethargic through the first three and a half quarters, let's say. But Kyrie Irving gives you a 5 of 15 performance from the field. And late, I mean, even late, by midway through this fourth quarter, you talk about leadership, Kyrie Irving chucked up a handful of triples and was like, hey, if they go down, I guess we're back in it. But if not, not like I'll, I'll extend that extra line. Now, I know some people have kind of, you know, busted Kyrie's chops on Twitter or in general because he's just come back to the team. And then he's talking about continuity and everybody getting on the same page. So maybe it's a little bit hard to extend this idea that, that Kyrie Irving needs to be the voice that kind of takes over there. But there's still two superstars on the court and neither one of them. You know, you know who was the most motivated? And was the guy who was moaning at everyone? It's the same guy we always talk about, Patty Mills. He was the guy that hit a big three to try to keep things close in the fourth quarter. He was the one trying to make the plays. Like he looked like the leader of the veteran leader of this team when you're trying to hang in this game. While your two superstars were kind of like, "Yeah, are we all good here?" Because like we got we got. Uh, I'll so. push back there because I wouldn't put Kyrie in the same version. I'm not of that, putting like, on the same level, but okay. I don't like right. the fact that by the time you get into this game here and you, once you see, I'll put it this way. Once you see that Harden clearly doesn't want to be a part of the game, there is a world where, like, yeah. I, you know, Kyrie Irving could be saying, hey, guy, 
<laughs> it's you and me, right, buddy? Like, I don't know, something, or or at least, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It didn't seem like there was a response to Harden's play, and we're going to get into a little bit well, see, the, give me, give me a number, too, but, like, yeah. like, so, and I, I'm with you, and, I, and Kyrie's never really been a, like a rah rah guy. Frankly, neither of these guys have been. Yeah. And, like, neither of these guys are not, their game isn't predicated on, like, the rah rah, like, you know, dig down deep and, like, just show everyone how to do it. Like, they, they, no, you're they, so they, good. They, you don't they, have to rah rah. Exactly. They they mostly got Kevin Durant kind of to some degree isn't like that either. It's like lead by some example, play really high level basketball nearly all the time. And turns out like that's most of the leadership you need. Right. That's usually yeah. what works. It, you know, there's some damning numbers in this one, too, though, because like the hard and lackadaisical piece, we only call out. I, I, we only use plus minus when it's so stark that it like probably does tell something of the story of what happened in a game. Mm -hmm. And in this game, both Kyrie and Harden played 37 minutes. So there's tons of overlap there. Right. Yeah. And then uh, during it, there's going to be rotational stuff where they're going to try to stagger their minutes in this game. Kyrie was a plus three and Harden was a minus 21. Yeah. Like that is so bad considering both of them played all but eight minutes of the game. Like, that means they got complete and considering how much they overlapped during that part, that means Harden lost his minutes like by even worse when Kyrie wasn't on the court. Like if you look, if that makes sense, like they, yeah, yeah, they yeah. got completely trucked when Harden was, was out in the court without Kyrie. And again, I just, I, you know, I'm only just trying to not put them in the same class here. I'm and not. I agree with you. Like right. at some point, someone needs to say something, which we're going to talk about more here in a second, but like someone needs to really be like, Hey, what WTF is going on here? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I know not, I'm hip WTF. Why the face hard? Well, I'm right? just like, actually, no, I'm, I'm saying, you know, cause I don't want to get, I, I need no, to I keep know. the clean sensor on. I, no, but hundred percent. Like that's what I mean. Somebody has to be saying that. And, and there's clearly different levels to, to what Harden was doing versus how Kyrie looked in this game. Cause there wasn't that sense around his game from tip off all the way through until you get well, to early point, in the but, game, early in the game. I, I know for me, I was like, man, we're getting some awesome Kyrie stuff here. Like yep, the dribbling yep. through traffic, like the just pulling off insanely difficult shots, like the part where he's sort of like uh personnel independent, like yep. where, you know, because like with Harden, we worry, do they have, does he have enough spacing around him? Harden actually need, kind of needs that. He doesn't need it. He can still get away without it. But at this point in his game, like he really actually needs probably at least two shooters on the court that can keep like defenses very honest around uh, the perimeter because he yep. needs room to operate past his primary defender. Um, Kyrie actually doesn't need any of that. Like Kyrie can have like, it's kind of seems like Kyrie could have like me, you, me, my wife, Courtney, <laughs> and, and then it's like in the Kyrie show, and you're like, right. yeah, we could probably get away with it. Like we could probably play even basketball <laughs> for most. We can like, win those minutes. Trucked. We can win those we're minutes. Gonna, well, we're trucked on defense, but the sure. offense is probably gonna be okay, and only because we just like hand it to him and then just go stand around like in other places around the court. But like, and that's where the and that's where the difference is game. So like. I think we saw a lot. Of, now we didn't see any of that from him in the second half. So no. like that was the other part. Like it kind of all began to fall apart. But man, ah, I'm just I'm fired up here. I, it's it's late at night. Like this is a West Coast game. But I'm just uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm feeling very conflicted about where this team stands right now. And I guess in a minute we can talk about where we stand on sort of like some high level stuff around what's happening here too. Yeah, I don't want to gloss over additionally what was wasted by James Harden's performance and then ultimately, to whatever level you want to put it at, uh, Kyrie Irving's performance as well. But before we do, got to remind you that today's episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing number of car parts, Doug will tell you, it's definitely more than seven. I don't know if Doug's pushing towards 20, maybe 3,000, somewhere in the mix, though. It's impossible It's a lot, man. Know. You ever look under the yeah. hood? It's so many. It's so many. There's like there's, there's sprockets, there's there's crockets and rockets, all things like that you rock. need a degree to make that machine. It's that's nuts. No, it, 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 listen, I'm not going to tell you that Doug and I are making your car for you. But the bottom line is these local chains, you go in there, you're asking for a part. They walk back in, knock the dust off something, hand it to you. You don't know if it's right or wrong. You get over to rockauto.com. You look up your make and model, your vehicle. You know, you're getting exactly the part that you need and you know that you're getting it at a great price. Why spend 30, 50, or 100% more for the car parts that you need from a chain store or a car dealership? Honda Odyssey, by the way, fuel pump, 353. No, no, no. 216 over at rockauto.com. That's called cash back in your pocket, friends. You head over to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts that are available for your car or truck right locked on in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you, and you will go ahead and have yourself a clean, satisfying experience around your automobile. A maiden selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Rockauto.com. 
So quickly before we get into um, some of the high-level stuff, just things that were wasted in this game. There was a time early on when I thought I was going to be talking about Nicholas Claxton and what felt like a breakout performance for him because he was having a heck of a game. A lot of those assists that we're talking about from James Harden were dump downs around the basket to Nicholas Claxton. He had a handful of blocks in this game as well. He was doing all the usual things that he does on defense. But that offensive piece where you know, we highlighted not finishing around the rim as, as, as high level he should be. He did that. Free throws. He mentioned early in the season, Kyle Corvers played a big role in him getting back on track from the line. Five of seven there, like the rebounds, 11 total. It's all there for you. you. Throw in James Johnson, right? He has a big game off the bench. And this is what I think was even more infuriating around James Harden and to whatever level Kyrie Irving is. You're wasting the quality supporting, supporting cast performance. And because we seem to do this a lot, Patty Mills also went five of 12 from the field, four of eight from beyond the arc, gave you 14 points in 32 minutes. Like, These guys did what they were supposed to do. They checked their boxes, and that's what I think makes it even more infuriating that you end up letting those things go by the wayside. And then, I've talked about this in other games, when some things look clunky, if Claxton misses a play, if Johnson's off the mark on a pass late in the game, you go, these guys got to be better. No, in this particular game, they did all the work that they had to do early. It's supposed to be the stars that bring it home late. Yeah, Claxton's best game of the year was super decisive on the offensive end. Said that early in the game. It was very clear. It's easier against bad defenses, so I get Mm -hmm. it. But, like, he was, you know, what I often think are, like, mini pauses that he takes in decision-making, whether to get to the rim, whether to go up to the basket, whether, like, how he's going to finish around the rim. I think he gets into his head a lot of on this stuff. Like, you can see it. It's like, why? It's like, what's that? Had a spin move tonight. Like, he spun yeah, and like went you, to the basket. It was incredible. Yeah. Well, you can just see. It's like why it looks clunky is because it's indecisive usually, right? It's like, am I going to dunk or am I going to try to finish soft, right? Am I going right. to... Am I going to drive to the basket now? Or am I going to kick to the corner because someone's open? Like it's all, a st- it's usually been a step slow for him. Um, and tonight it just kind of wasn't like he actually made almost every right decision. I thought of the, on the offensive end. And I totally agree with you to waste. This is, um, I guess waste is the wrong word to, to lose a game where you get a really great performance. I guess that's just waste. Like to lose a game where you get, get, get a great, it's like, Oh, Hey, uh, Siri, what is waste? Define waste for me. <laughs> no, oh, that's good. Uh, I'll use it. I'll use it. I like it. To fine. not capitalize on this type of performance. <laughs> yeah. Well, close enough. So, anyway, um, but yeah, so, so they, yeah, just, they did like, waste just, it and it was brutal. Yeah. To lose that stuff, like, especially around his game, which finally looked like, you know, a little cleaner around it. Dude, can we just get into, like, the other stuff here, though? Here's the like, deal. The, right. So yeah. th- that I, I wanted to make sure, because I, I I don't know. Maybe I just always want to give some type of positive something around the game. These guys played really well. Good for them. Here's the part, though. It's it, it's called the blame <laughs> game, right? So <laughs> there, there's fans over on Twitter that are asking, where where was Dayron Sharp in this entire game? So th- this does go to the coaching level to Steve Nash. We said before, when uh, players are coming off of non-COVID-related illnesses all season long, there's a track record of them not bringing them back immediately. I even put the old toe in the water of maybe they don't want to see him get injured before the trade deadline because he and Cam Thomas are the names that are mentioned from the Brooklyn Nets in terms of young assets that other teams would be interested in getting back in return, assuming that Kessler Edwards is off limits. Are, where do you stand on Nash? Because I know I think you're you're getting um, – you're, you're getting away from defending against the onslaught that feels like Steve Nash is, is the root of all evil for this team. Well, I've been like weirdly probably labeled some kind of like weird Steve pro Steve Nash guy, which I was like, clearly not. I called, gave his performance an incomplete last time. Like that was the clear grade. We God, gave you on it, love right? him. Don't you incomplete? Well, these days you if you're not against well, like, this, <laughs> this ridiculous world we live in now, where if you're not against someone, you're for him, like yeah. just, you know, check, you got to probably check yourself. Um, pretty regularly around if you think like what someone actually said and i gave him an incomplete last time and like said like you know some stuff has been fine and some stuff has been you just can't give a clear grade on it yeah uh i think like rotationally and stuff on this game i wasn't too um i didn't really care too much about what was or not care. i didn't like really dig too much around what he was doing because they just still have um they just still have just like roster set up problems. They just don't have enough mm-hmm. shooters, all this other stuff. Yeah. I will say like from a problematic point of view. And I think what we've seen so far from him is he's, and I think I can say this pretty confidently. He's just like not a motivator, right? Like, I don't, and I don't think we've seen a lot of examples of him. There's not a lot of rah, rah stuff. It goes both ways. Like there's not a lot of rah, rah stuff on the one end. He doesn't get, he doesn't like people want him to get teed up. I, I think that's kind of sort of silly sometimes, but maybe throws a signal that like you care. I could probably hear some of that, but 
at some point, and maybe this is off camera because we're not at the game. At some point, there has to be something like a timeout. Like, hey, what the F is going on here? Like, wake up. These are the Kings. We're on the road. You have to win. Get back out there and get aggressive. Yeah. And it just doesn't seem, from what we can take away from the broadcast, it just doesn't seem as if that is happening. It also doesn't seem like sort of how that's he's that like he's constructed and maybe you'll never get out of it. But I can definitely see the frustration because these are the games where you need to just kind of lose your mind a little bit and say, hey, time out. What is going on? Like, Here's the and I don't think okay. I, I agree. I, I disagree with you on the motivation around the young players and the role players, because, again, this is a great game where and even early on you saw Cam Thomas, Steve Nash was communicating with him after you took a little early foul under the basket, just saying, hey, you're doing the right thing. But, da, 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 you know, those little those little side steps that you want to have there throughout the game. Y you've been getting great performances from Kessler Edwards. That that's a part of being motivated by the coach. Nicholas Claxton in this one, James Johnson, Patty Mills, like all these guys. So I push back on the sense that, like, he's not motivating those. those I'm not referring to them. I'm not. I referring know, to I know you're I'm not. Ref now, I'm, referring so to, I'm referring to Harden. Like now here's I, the like other part it. of it. So yeah, right. So now Harden, I'm so now listen, on the one the, the, on the one hand, I look in the fourth quarter and I go, there is a world where I think Steve Nash, if he if he has the authority, depending on the construct of having superstars on your team, there he just goes, you know what, Harden, we're all good here. You can go ahead and just take the rest of the night off because you've been basically a zero. Actually, you've been a minus 21, right? Like we don't need you out on the court. You can sit down. That's a move that he can go ahead and make. But in terms of motivating. Kyrie Irving or specifically James Harden. You got to if you have to motivate one of the best players in the game, I mean that that that's a Harden problem. That's not a Steve Nash problem. James Harden should not need Steve Nash to call a timeout and say, "Hey pal, this game's important. We just lost to the Warriors. We just lost to the Suns. We don't have Kevin Durant. We need you to step up." Like, of course, it's incredibly clear we need you to step up. You're one of the three best players in you know in the league. You're one of the superstars on this team. It should be it, it, it's unspoken. It should be common sense. We don't have Kevin Durant. You need to help lead this team. The fact that, that James Harden somehow that escaped him, that that was important for him to be a part of that process, I, I can't put that on Steve Nash. And I'm not excusing any of the other things that we criticize him for or stuff that we don't like, whatever ch choices that he makes. But in terms of him being responsible for motivating James Harden, I, I just I can't have it. I can't. You've been you're, you're 33 years old. You've been in the league for 12 years, whatever it is. Like. You know what it takes to win a basketball game against a crappy team, and that's the biggest part of it. They're a crap team. Harden should be able to drop 30 on them with his eyes closed, and instead he gave you four points and a bunch of turnovers and a lackluster performance where he clearly didn't want to play. Yeah, I'm not absolving Harden here. I, yeah. or, like I'm not, I'm not absolving anybody from this. I'm just saying that there's a, there's sort Nash of is like, responsible to bench him. That, that's what I think he should. Oh, I don't, actually, I, yeah, I would push back on that. I don't think you bench him, but I think there needs to be because even if you read the, the, the post game comments, which are coming in now as we're recording, like it's, uh, you know, it's, I thought James Harden looked tired tonight. He didn't have his legs. It was one of those nights. I'm like, I'm not sure that's good enough for this. Like, th that's kind of, that's what I'm fine. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. That, like, that's fine. That's fair too. And, and if that's the way that you were going through the game, which was like, hey, you're tired, this just is what it is. Um, I'm not sure that's like totally good enough. And, Again, like some of this is going to be kind of piecing it together because like we're not on the sidelines and we don't know each individual conversation that's happening. They're not going to give a mic'd up around these situations. And so, I mean, if that's the thing you want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt on, I guess I would say from hearing those post game comments, I would say that probably wasn't happening because mm -hmm. if like, you know, if it's going to be like, there's no other sort of like through the media motivation here, I, I guess, I, I guess that all I'm saying is I think we've known from the start that Nash was not going to be a rah-rah guy. The idea around him was going to be Hall of Fame talent makes his way to the bench. We've seen this happen lots of times. Guys of his caliber don't go and like be, work like videotape assistant and then like work their way up the chain. That's <laughs> just like not that's just not the way it works. Tell you know, boys, Steve Nash. Nash. Yeah, it's like there's been plenty of examples of this. Like it's just it's happened. But they are, but they're there to be sort of superstar managers, right? Like they're there to be like, you know, you know, massage egos while also understanding it. And if that, and if the X's and O's piece is going to be not perfect, but this other part isn't working either, I guess I just see this game as like a little bit more of a warning sign. Nah, that's, I'm, st this, I'm still this, giving this it comes back. This again comes back to, uh, yeah. No, this this again to me comes back though to 
because if you're ta- if we're now if you're talking about like Steve Nash managing the egos, managing the superstars, and, and really being the buffer between them and the criticism, right? Because that's also a part of a head coach protecting your team sure. against the media, right? Yeah, so in the post game press conference, when he says, eh, "I didn't look like he quite had his legs," you know, looked like he was a little bit tired there. I don't like the answer. That doesn't feel good enough for me. But by the way, it's the total milk toast response that doesn't get any ire put onto James Harden. Ah, you didn't have your legs. You're still, you know, you're, you know, you're a, little, a little bit exhausted. Now we can examine that from its whole own set of issues. But that to me does feel like Steve Nash being like, yeah, listen, I got a thousand cliche things I can tell you in this post game sure. around why it didn't quite work out. That's the buffer because, again, if the premise is you bring this guy in to manage them, it's also the expectations that he's not going to butt heads with them. And that and that is where any of these anything that anyone's going to talk about cr- criticizing or critiquing him, good or bad, I don't care. It's fine. Steve Nash, you have to remember. It's, you're brought in with a certain set of stipulations. You're here to be on the same page with Kevin Durant, with James Harden, with Kyrie Irving. You're not here to be their adversary. You're not here to try to stoke the fires, per se. And you're not here, even to my point, you're not here to stick him on the bench when it looks like he's dogging it a little bit in the game. Like So it's, it's, it's a bit of a catch-22 in that regard. I think, if anything, I'm taking out of this game, whatever you want to read into about where Harden's head's at, these type of games to me are are indicative of where this guy feels about the burden or load that's been put on him. No Kyrie to start the year. Now, no Kevin Durant and maybe where his head's at in the big picture. And maybe James Harden would prefer to just take some games off here and not have to be overly taxed. And at that point, Steve Nash could say, we're giving him a night off. The hand acted up again, right? The hamstring flared up. You can do that and just get Harden out of there because if he's on the court and he's performing like that, it's a really bad look. And, and, you said at the top, it's a bad look, basically, for the entire organization. Oh, I think it's a total F. F across the board here. It's like A, F and- B, C, D, Let's go through E. Let's go. There you go. F. And we got there. It's a. the last one Ooh, we the, said. Well, the odd E in there. It's like you always, when you got an E, if you got an E, you're like, it could be excellent, Excelsior? but it could be slotted between D and F. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like that could, like, now I'm in a weird spot where I need e. to ask. Because, like, some of these are totally clear, but this E one is, like, not totally I clear. I got an E. For- Good. <laughs> well, so, class. By the way, classic American educational system that would skip the E in the grading thing, just be and like just to confuse everybody. Why do we need it? Like, yeah, we yeah. It's that. like, oh, the rest of the alphabet just goes in this order, but in this in this scenario, we just skip it. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. All right. On that note, we are gonna get out of here. <laughs> really good one, guys. <laughs> go go check out the YouTube channel, Locked On Nets YouTube. Obviously, there's been like a million comments in there. <laughs> Try to respond to as many as possible over it's the last. Great, though, I days. love it. I really appreciate it. Yeah, even the ones I disagree with, I still appreciate it. So always know that. Um, you can I'll put the link in the show notes. Go uh, subscribe to the Locked On Nets YouTube channel. It's all over the place. We don't know which way is up, right? And it just brings to mind, you know what happens when you Tokyo drifting? It leads to bickering, which of course leads to karate. Mac McDonald. <laughs> all right, one of the all-time great poets. We'll be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.